Well, most of you guys know that we've been in the the study for the letters of John, so if you would, let's go ahead and get our Bibles out, and we'll go over to uh, 1 John, chapter 3. And again, if you do not have a Bible, there are Bibles in the baskets around the the sanctuary here that you can grab. Uh, You can take home. You can do whatever you need with those. We just want to support you with that. And then also, we do have YouVersion up and running as usual, which is an online app that you can download for free. And then you do a search within the local events or live events, And you'll see TSF in today's date. And that will give you all the scriptures and places to put prayer requests and all kinds of different tools that are there as well. But in 1 John 3, we're going to find that he's kind of revisiting something that we have gone into from a little bit of a different perspective. If you've not been with us so far in this letter, John John does a great job of laying foundation and then asking questions. Laying foundation and then asking questions. And the overall foundation of the fact that as Christians... And when I say Christians, I'm talking about those who have made a conscious choice decision to accept Jesus as leader and forgiver in their life by acknowledging with their mouth that he's the son of God. You're God, I'm not. I'm giving my life back to you. Believing in their hearts, they died and rose again. I don't deserve your mercy and grace, but I accept your mercy and grace and your forgiveness into this new life. What kind of new life? Away from the corrupt life and back to the life that he created us for in the beginning that he is saying that we as Christians, if you fall into that boat, then we should know what this life looks like biblically. We should know what this life looks like. We should enjoy this life, that this is a life of victory, of purpose, of passion, and that we should have it so much en- enjoyment of it in our lives that it just overflows in sharing it with others, telling them our testimonies, telling them about the gospel, inviting them to church, taking and telling them how they can have this life too. And so as he lays this foundation, then he starts asking these questions to say, okay, now ask yourself this to say, am I doing that? Because a lot of times our first response is like, oh, yeah. But here's some things to kind of prod that a little bit. Is there some places we can go deeper? Is there some places that we can find some new victory? And the two overall questions, again, there's a lot of many questions in this, but the overall questions that we have studied so far started out with one on love and one talking about truth. The first one is, do your actions match up to your heart to love God and to love others, or do your actions actually show that you love the world or that you're focused on yourself? The next week or last week when we dug into it more, had more to do with truth as he talked to us about the spirit of the Antichrist or the spirit of false teaching or false doctrine or of, of, of following a way that wasn't of God, even with sometimes the best of intentions, that that's of the world and that's prevalent. But are you walking in a spirit of error or are you walking in the spirit of the truth? And as we see over and over again, I know for years I've been talking about the 100% love, 100% truth, that we need full measure of both. We can't have half of one and half of the other. Whenever we, we don't bring the full measure of one, we're not really bringing the other anyways. We see it in the scripture over and over again. We've got to have this love. We've got to have this truth. Well, as we go into chapter 3, uh, verse 8, I believe is where we're at. Are we? Yeah. Nope, 11. Um, he segues back into love. He wants to talk to us some, about some things when it comes to how we love, not as much about God, even though that's what's reflected, but how we love one another. So let me read verse 11, and we'll do what we usually do again, read a little, talk a little, and see what we find today. <clears throat> verse 11 says this, This is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. In other words, everything we're going to talk about today is not a surprise. It's generally not a shocker. This message isn't new. This isn't something that we're creating to be hip and cool with the Shepherd's Fellowship to get people to come hang out with us. This is, this is just the message from the beginning of time, from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, from the time of John writing this letter a couple thousand years ago to today. This is not anything new, but it's central. We cannot proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ and not love one another, especially when the Scripture tells us that the world will know us the church by our love. That's our very foundation. That's our very witness. That's how we love one another. He says, so this is not new, but we're going to bring this back up to beginning because this is the message that you and I are supposed to love one another. And then he moves into his foundation. Verse 12. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil, and his brothers uh, righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that this world 
hate you. Okay, so we introduce a narrative. We un I hate, again, I hate to call these stories because then it sounds like it's a fictional thing that we're supposed to teach our kids. Th this is a narrative, this is a testimony that, that happened that is referring to. That if you're saying, if I'm giving you a message from the beginning of time, let me give you an example from the beginning of time. So let's talk about Cain and Abel just to make sure we're all on the same page. Because, um, again, I think sometimes we assume all of us know the same stuff. Now, I would say that most of us have least heard of Adam and Eve, the first man God created, the first woman that God created. And their story, or their testimony, their narrative of how sin first entered into the mix. But what we have here, when we're talking about Cain and Abel, we're talking about their boys, at least the first two boys. And so, in other words, we're talking about the sequel to Adam and Eve's story. We've got the Empire Strikes Back version of uh, After New Hope. And if you don't get that reference, I pray for you. Um, <laughs> Everyone should know Star Wars. I'll work with you. But, um, but this is the sequel, and this is when we've got Cain born first, the older brother. We've got Abel born second, and I love his name because of the message that comes with this. Uh, but he's born second. And one of the things that I have always liked to do, and this is in Genesis 4, if you want to do, do some study on this later on, um, is what was their relationship like? You know, how many people have siblings Older, younger, whatever. Anybody? I'm the only person that has a sibling. Okay. <laughs> I'm not raising my hand just because the pastor said to. Um, the, um, how many of you guys were annoyed by them at some point or the other? <laughs> I shouldn't ask that question when sisters are in the house. Uh, <laughs> there was a little bit too much enthusiasm from that side. Uh, I was the youngest, uh, smartest, best looking, uh, most loved of the family. My brother is five years older. My sister is seven years older. And uh, so I got to kind of play the fill, because the main rivalry seemed to be between them when we were growing up, and I got to pick whose side I wanted to be on, and I played that for a very long time until they caught on. Uh, but as brothers and sisters, we know we kind of sometimes have friction as well as love with one another, but think about that relationship in an environment where you didn't have school, you didn't have soccer, you didn't have chess club, you didn't have any other social stuff going on, you've got Cain and you've got Abel, right? I know, I know there's some different theories about how God, God created more, didn't create more, all came from Adam and Eve, but no matter how you look at it, they had each other. And so I have to assume that those days they annoyed each other, but they had to have a lot of love and dependency on one another as well. That was their social circle. And so as they grew in that, there came a time when both are working, because again, that's part of the penalty of sin, they're, they're, they're working hard. And... Um, Cain is working the fields. He's a farmer, basically, essentially what we would compare that to. Uh, and then you got Abel, who's tending sheep, so he's a shepherd, and going from that standpoint. And they're kind of making their way in the world as they grow up and kind of carrying their share. And what they we find is this moment that changes everything. This moment that when they have a time of offering, like we did a little bit here, those looked quite different when it comes to sacrificing, that Abel bought his first fruits. That's a phrase of saying he came to God with what he had first, that God was first, and then everything else was whatever was left over. And he bought his first fruit of his sheep to sacrifice. Cain, on the other hand, bought some stuff on the farm, but it wasn't his first fruit. There's even maybe a little bit hinting here that maybe it was the stuff that he didn't want to eat anyways. So he's giving God kind of the leftovers. And gives that to God. And we find that God has a response to this. He finds Abel righteous and blesses him, and Cain doesn't get the same, same deal. And Cain becomes upset. Can't understand why God would treat him like this. And so it's according to the Bible, his face fell. In other words, he was angry, he was upset about it. And so God comes and talks to him. In verse 6 of chapter 4, it says, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And so the Lord comes to him and just says, this is not that hard, Cain. Be faithful and I've got you. Or don't and you're putting yourself in harm's way. If you give of your first fruits, if you give of your best like your brother is, you're going to get the exact same deal that he's getting. What you want is right there. It's easy to do. If you don't, he doesn't say that I'm going to send you immediately to hell because I'm tired of this crap. Oh, I'm going to send some lightning bolt and I'm going to take you out. He says, if you don't, I'm concerned for you. 
Because what that means is somewhere within all of this, you're justifying sin. So sin is crouching at the door trying to overtake you. And if it overtakes you, it's going to harm you. So you must get control over this. You must get control over this. Do you see that? And I mean, again, we can cover the, this particular section. I know a lot of times when I talk about tithes and offerings, I, we go to Malachi and we talk about God taking and saying, you're stealing from me, and we can talk about all that. This is just as prevalent. When God is first, we're in line with him. And when we don't, if we're really honest with ourselves and looking at things from John's standpoint and putting things and nailing them up against the wall, sin's crouching at the door, it's trying to take you over, and you've got to get this. You've got to get this. Now, I would like to think if I was Cain in this moment, and it was just as simple as bringing him my best and everything else is going to work out, that I would say, oh, well, that makes sense, and do it. Don't be kind of, especially if God's talking to you directly, you're like hearing him audibly, right? You would think that you would do that, but we oftentimes don't, and Cain did not. Cain was still jealous. James, he was still upset, and he did not like God's answer to him. So he takes his brother out in the field, comes up behind him, takes a rock, plunges him to death. Because if he's not here, he can't be taking and doing his offering, and then all God's got is me, and I can just kind of do what I want. Man, it's pretty messed up. It's pretty messed up. But that's what he did. He looked at it from a standpoint of hatred and anger and rebellion instead of leaning into God and submission. And he kills his brother. He hated instead of love. He had a self-focus. He had a jealousy of Abel's righteousness. He had a lack of tangible love for God. He had a lack of tangible evidence of love for his brother. And the sin self-control takes Mordor's tone in a world that had never seen Mordor before. We should not be like Cain, who is of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. The attitude of Cain is the world. And it should not be mine and it should not be yours. So then he starts asking us some questions. Let's go into verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. That's the evidence, is we love the brothers. We love the sisters. We love each other. That's how we know we pass from death into life. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And I think that John wants to make sure we get that. It's like, well, I've never taken anybody out in the field and smashed them in the house, you know, with a rock and killed them. Slander, gossip, pulling away from people, shutting them down in your lives. There's a lot of ways that we can kill each other. That's not the way it should be with us. So here's the first question that I think that we can pull from this that John is asking us to consider. Do you have a genuine love for other believers? Do you have a genuine love for other believers? And make sure if you're writing it down as notes, which, by the way, you get a gold star because I like note takers, underline genuine. Underline genuine because this is the imperative part. I was uh, going through, doing the study, looking at some different things, and I came across an article, um, and I like to give credit where credit is due. It's called Seven Distinguishing Marks of Genuine Love. Uh, by a gentleman by the name of Colin Smith on unlockingthebible.com. And he basically goes into 1 Corinthians 13, uh, where Paul is talking about love and what love is and defines what love is, which is imperative because when we don't want to do something, we water down the commandment as much as we possibly can to make it easy or comfortable. So it's important to define what love is. And he looks at Paul's definition of love, and he brings up some things about love that we can ask ourselves to say, is my love truly love? Or am I just saying it? Because if I, if I say, do you love your brothers and sisters of Christ? Everybody's going to go, yes, right? I mean, I, I don't know of anybody in our house that would say, well, no, I hate most of you guys. I really find you despicable and can't stand you. But we're going to say yes. But are we defining love the way that Christ defines love, that the scripture defines love to see if we are loving others, including those in our house and those out of our house? And so here's, here's some of the things he pulls, pulls out of it. If you're asking yourself, do I have genuine love towards my brothers and sisters in Christ? 
Is your love patient? Is your love patient? If anybody knows 1 Corinthians 13, or you've gone to a few weddings and they wed it, you know that that's one of the things that he says is a quality of love. Is your love patient? Um, and when we apply it, again, if we take it a little bit deeper, that I think is a little challenging. If I said, if you, let's say you fall into a boat where you have kids. Not all of us have kids. Not all of us are called to have kids. But let's say you do, and I think everybody else will ride along with the example. If somebody asked you, do you love your kids? Your answer should be yes, right? I mean, I think mo- majority of people would say, yes, I love my kids. Are you patient with your kids? Might be a little bit more challenging. If you're saying you're loving them, you're supposed to be patient with them. And so now all of a sudden it becomes a little bit deeper. Are you patient with your spouse, with your kids? Absolutely. Are you patient with yourself? Absolutely. But are you patient with your brothers and your sisters in Christ? Is your love generous? Do you have generosity? Ask the same type of question. Do you love your neighbor? Sure, I love my neighbor. Well, your neighbor has had the pandemic and he's been out of work for two months and he's got a $252 electric bill that he can't pay and they're going to turn off the electric. Um, What's your thoughts? And you look at the bank and you've got the money. What's your thoughts? Well, I'll tell them I'm praying for them and uh, change the topic. Is your love towards one another genuine? Is your love humble? Is your love humble? We live in a culture, and, and, and I do this too, and I, I know I've joked about it before. We live in a culture when we just naturally focus on ourselves more than other people. We just do. Somebody comes up and tells you, oh, man, I didn't get any sleep last night. I only got four hours of sleep. And you're like, you think you got bad? I only got three hours of sleep. It's not, hey, well, how can I minister to you in that moment? It's like, hey, let's have a competition to see which life blows more. You know, it's just kind of our natural tendency of where it goes into. And then there's other times that we try to help others, especially if you have a caregiver heart and a caregiver mentality, and you find yourself in seasons where it feels like I'm serving and I'm serving and I'm doing things for other people and I'm listening to other people and I'm inviting people to coffee and all this other stuff. And then when I need somebody, nobody's there. What about me? Let me, let me just say this. If you switch from self-focus... Now, that doesn't mean that you, can't, don't, that you don't need help. It just means my first thought is not self-focused, but you. I guarantee there will be days where you wonder, why isn't anybody there for me? It just happens. I, I, I live a, a, a life and a calling that's all about service. I get it. I fully get it. But I can guarantee you this. If you live a life of caring about other people, even before yourself, not at the cost of yourself, but before yourself, with healthy boundaries, you will build relationships that are there for you when you need it. I guarantee it. A lot of times when I'm sitting there going, oh, poor Tom, if I stop and think, I can come up with five names. If I actually took a move to call somebody and say, hey, I'm struggling, they'd say, where at? Where do you want to meet? What's going on? A lot of times we just think that people are supposed to figure it out somehow instead of communicating about it. If we live a victim mentality life, then that's a whole different standpoint. But if it's humble, then you have that. In the, okay, so if you're loving your brothers and sisters in Christ, then your love will also be courteous. It won't be rude. It won't be sharp. It won't be mean. I mean, I'm a sarcastic person, and a lot of my friends are sarcastic people. And we like to rib one another. Um, and that's one thing, but you also have to be cautious because that can turn on you real quick with one misunderstanding. We've got to make sure that we're being courteous and not rude. And I was thinking about this particular one. I was like, what do I compare that to? Um, and for me, I compared it to fast food drive throughs and restaurants. That's what I compared it to. Because I, I have, um, and I'm aware of this in myself, I have to kind of watch this a little bit. I have a very high bar of what I think customer service should be. I spent years in retail management and training and experience and, and how to treat a customer. And uh, just if any of our folks are working drive through I just want to let you know if a customer says thank you to you, uh, Mm-hmm. is not an appropriate answer. It's just not. Or sliding the glass door closed like you didn't hear them. It, the only two answers are either saying thank you back or you're welcome. It's the only two. I mean, I get really annoyed at that kind of stuff. It's the type of stuff I notice quickly. Uh, and then when you meet somebody that brings a little courtesy to it, it just brings it to a whole other level. You enjoy the experience. You have some community with it. I, uh, I don't know. It was last Monday or Tuesday. I was calling uh, a local pizza place. And to be honest, we go to this 
it's not belly busters just because everybody knows I love belly busters, but a place here in Maine that we, we go to a couple times a month maybe because uh, I like my pizza. And um, I'm saying customer service is probably a 50-50 mix, probably like a C, somewhere in that range. Uh, and, the, uh, and the young lady answered the phone and she asked for my phone number, so I gave my phone number. Uh, and then she said, what, what's your last name today? And before I noticed it myself, <laughs> She started laughing hysterically at herself, and not like in a rude way where she's like, guys, you won't believe what I just did, uh -huh. but it's just kind of like started giggling at herself, and she's like, I just realized what I said, and I said, well, I said, if it helps you any, it is the, the same last name as I had yesterday, and uh, so I told her hypes, and we just laughed about stuff, and then when I went in and I told her hypes, she got the giggling again, and I said, if it helps you any, I'm more than happy to go by Thompson. Um, that's fine too. But she just had a great demeanor about it and she was bringing me into the conversation and, and it, it, was, um, it was just pleasant and I, and I really enjoyed it. And this, this you, you can have different opinions on this than me. Again, I know I have uh, defined uh, things in these areas. But I generally, just me, I don't tip for takeout. I tip for service. Now, I'm not trying to be anybody else. And when I have service, if, if it's average to good, I tip well. But just for, for takeout, to answer the phone, I just, I, I generally don't tip. I walked out with a 20% tip with her because we had that connection, we had that relationship, and she made me feel better about coming there in the future, even though the next time they might just go, yeah, what do you want? There's something about courtesy that takes it to another level. The same is true in your relationships and how we love one another. And I know there's got to be a wife in here that wants to smack her husband on the shoulder or a husband wants to smack his wife on the shoulder. If, can we bring some courtesy back into the relationship and appreciate each other? It makes a difference. Okay, I went longer on that one because I think it's one we don't think about that much. Uh, if you love your brothers and sisters Christ, it's going to show restraint. Love has restraint. Uh, and that's going to come a different, couple of different ways. That usually comes back to anger, whether or not you blow up with your anger and people feel like they have to handle you with kids' gloves all the time. That's not loving. If you're a person that pins up your anger and it builds and it builds and it builds and you pull away and then sooner or later it has to blow up, that's not restraint. That's not communication. It's true whether we blow it up or hold it in. It's true on social media as well as it is within the house or within the work or within our community. When has that ever really worked for you? When has it ever worked for you? When has it ever blessed your testimony? to be somebody that everybody knows you can blow up in any second. It has restraint. Love is restraining. Love is full of joy. Do you have joy in your relationships with your brothers and sisters in Christ? 1 Corinthians 13, 6 says, It does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Do we rejoice within the truth? I think this is a big question, and if you watched my, the video that I put out this week on what I think our biggest challenges are as a church right now, uh, and what's going to most greatly impact us in our future of the church, uh, I think this really falls into the place. We are a people who say, come and see, in a season where nobody wants to go anyplace. Oh, let's go and reach out when everybody says, stay away from me. And we say we're relational in a time where we all feel disconnected. Is that fair? I think that's fair. And when you do that for six, seven, eight months, 12 months, whatever the case would be, that has an impact. We, we, we see it and, uh, and we hear about it and sometimes we feel it when it comes to people that struggle with anxiety, with people that struggle with depression, with people that struggle with life as a whole, we're feeling the effects of that just as much as any illness could give to us. That's just true. And when it comes to the church, when it comes to COVID and those type of things, we feel disconnected from one another. And when we feel disconnected from one another, we don't give each other as much grace as we used to. When we get disconnected from one another, and especially if we're a person that doesn't reach out to others generally, we don't like to pick up the call and ask somebody else to go get coffee, or we don't like to go do this or whatever, then we end up not feeling connected to people and we start thinking that people don't care about us. And sometimes you can get really ticked off at the pastor or somebody, something going on in the church where normally you would give grace, but you don't get to do that handshake and that hug every week, and now it just doesn't feel the same anymore. There's a lot of impact that we're having right now. People that are serving, 
during this time. I talked about this in the video. They have been serving, 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 and because they don't see the immediate impact because we're not together like we used to be, it's getting to the point of this doesn't feel like it used to be anymore. Maybe I should give up. This is a very overwhelming time, a disconnected time, when love is saying that we should have joy with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'll tell you the solution. Not just with COVID, but almost every single time we're annoyed with the brother or sister of Christ. Most of the time. If we both have our hearts in the right place, and we're both following God, and the Spirit is leading, here's the solution. A conversation. It usually is a conversation. And you know it to be true because you've sent a text to somebody that somebody took long and you guys sat down at Panera and they were all upset and you said, no, that's not what I meant. What I meant was this. And now they can see your facial expression and know what your intent is. And they go, oh, okay, I'm just reading the text. I thought this. You know what I'm talking about? There was a void there. They, they couldn't see your face. They couldn't hear your expressions. And whenever there's a void anywhere, 99% of us are going to fill it with negative thoughts, not with positive assumptions. Love has joy. Do you have joy for your brothers and sisters in Christ? And then the last one he put, and just think about this, is your love consistent. Is your love consistent? I love Paul's writing in this where he says, he doesn't say love protects, love trusts, love hopes, love perseveres. He says love always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Does any of this sound like Cain? any of it. That's not the way of the world. It's the way of Christians. And we need to make sure that we're following along to say, do I have genuine love for my brothers and sisters in Christ? Is it in action? Is it consistent? It doesn't give the benefit of the doubt. Does it have the conversation? Does it warrant me reaching out and not just waiting for everybody else to do it to me? Second question, verse 16. By this we know love that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother or sister as in need, yet closes his heart against them, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk about, about it, but, it, but let us love in deed and let us love in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Second question to explore is this. Do you demonstrate your love in word and in deed? Do you do it in both? He's not downing speaking about love. He's downing that you don't back it up with your actual actions. In word, let's think about this a little bit. What kind of words are we putting out there? Are we communicating with people when we're going through tough times, or do we just shut them down and hide? Do we uplift others with the words that we have, the courtesy that we bring to it, or do we bring them down? This is a struggle for me. I do not tear down people face to face. A lot of people are really generous to say I'm an encourager, but I'm a sarcastic person at heart. And so when I leave, and it's just me, or if it's just me and my wife or my daughter, they have to kind of watch me and my, because we can take and be sarcastic about things or frustrated and let it out in the wrong way or whatnot. God is still growing me in that area. He's grown me a lot in the last 10 years. I'm going to say that. But boy, I always have room to grow. The same thing. Are we tearing down people to their face or even behind their back? Because that's exactly what Cain did was he snuck up and it always blows up. Do you have conversations with people? Or do you communicate with people? Do you talk at people or do you listen and do you learn? Do you listen and learn? Or do you just want to let other people hear you? Have your way, get your way. So we have to make sure the words match up, but the deeds have to as well. The actions have to meet the words. The actions have to meet the intent. I think most of you guys are loving people. But sometimes we can act pretty unloving, and we need to make sure that these things match up, that it always preserves, it always loves. 
Look at verse 16, 17, and 18 if you got it. I like the progression within it. First off, I like 16. This is a little bit of a side note because it's really a strong partner verse to John 3.16. Same guy writes this, this, this same text. John 3.16, right? One of the most common Bible verses we, we've got is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. By this we know that love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Beautiful partner verses. Keep in mind, that's the spirit. It's not like John said, hey, I've got an idea of a little Easter egg that I can do in my letter. There was no such thing as First John when John wrote this. There was no such thing as chapter 3. There was no such thing as verse 16. These are tools that were added later to help you and I study the, the letters. But by the Spirit's providence, the two go together. I, I love that. But I just love the progression. We know love because of Jesus and what he has done. So, verse 17, we should be able to love our brothers with our goods, those that are in need, and help them to be able to move forward. And then, let us not just love in word and talk, but indeed in truth. It's a progression that challenges us to ask, do we demonstrate our love in word and deed? I came across this the exact same day that I was going through some uh, materials. Uh, I, I, I shared with you guys before, and I'm, 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 uh, maybe you saw on Facebook, I've been having a lot of meetings. People are probably tired of me. Um, meeting with the elders this Tuesday about some things, as I think we're getting ready to shift into a new season that I'm pretty excited about. And when we we're, we're, were seeking a season, a lot, that, there's a lot of prayer that comes into that. There's a lot of observation that comes into that. There's a lot of communication that goes into that. But like seeking a season, like studying a sermon, I like to kind of get my stuff down and then challenge it by going to outside sources. And that's kind of what I was doing at the same time as this. I was going through some uh, material from Church Revitalization University where I was asking questions that were kind of prodding, what will the church look like on the other side of this? What will your church look like on the other side of this? And a lot of it is like the common stuff, like are you matching up to your church values? Are you matching up to your biblical values? Do you have right systems in place to help people to spiritual discipleship? Do you have right systems in place to make sure that the pastor is not burning himself out and those type of things? But one of the ten kind of stood out to me, was especially right after reading this, which said, make sure that you're not just noticing problems, but that you're solving them. And I think we're really good at noticing problems, and we're not always the best at solving them. And, but when we do take that extra step, man, it's glorious. It's really encouraging to see. Uh, let me share one story with you from this week that I'm not going to share a lot of details in because it's one of those anonymous private things. I don't want to violate somebody's uh, heart of just following the Lord. But there, I had some friends... Uh, here within the church, I had an extra. I had a car, an older car. Still works, works pretty well. Um, and if I, they just didn't need it anymore. And if you and I had that, what do we do? We slap a for sale sign on it, see if we can get a couple thousand bucks and turn that into a boat, right? That's the only natural thing to do. But for them, they sent me a, a text and said, Pastor, this is what, what we've got. We want to donate this to help somebody in need. Uh, do you have any thoughts? And we have several people within our ministry that don't have cars right now, that have needs. So there's a lot of thoughts. So we went into some prayer, we went into some conversations, I was asking some different people to see where they're at and what's going on. And through that process, we couldn't help everybody that has a need, but they could help one. And so they are giving a car to one. Now that one also has a car. It's been broken down, parked in the, park, the driveway for a long period of time, they can't do anything with it. So they've been trying to save some money to either fix it or sell it to be able to put it towards another car, and it just hasn't been going real well. So we're going to sell that second car. And for whatever we get that second car, instead of her keeping that money or they, her, him keeping that money, that's going to help this, another family. It's going to roll on. It's going to go to another step within it. That's awesome to be a part of. And we see that a lot here. I, I'm really blessed that we see that a lot here. And then there's opportunities we just miss that we don't see here. I mean, I like the car thing so much that, that you, you, you guys know how much I know about cars, right? <laughs> Even a brother within the church stepped in to be able to help us out to educate us so that we can sell the second car. There's multiple people into that. I love that stuff. If someone comes to me and says, Pastor, here's my situation I'm going through. I have to move. I have nobody. Can you help me find some people to help move? 
My response at this point, I'm just being honest with you, I'm going to give it all I've got, and there's a good shot it's not going to work out because nobody will step up. It's all Kelly Hill. It happens all the time. You have as much luck helping each other move in the church as you do if you're trying to get people from your office, place, or your school. It's just, just been what our experience is. Recently, we had somebody within the church, had a couch that was broken, need to get it out of the living room so they could get another couch in. We sent out two emails. All we had to do is move it to the dumpster. We're not even moving it to somebody else's house. Just move it to the dumpster. Zero. The problem's now fixed because she called her old church and her old church helped her out when we wouldn't. We can miss things. It's the best of intentions. It's the pandemic season. We've all got things going on. But there's a difference between noticing a need and stepping into a need. Right now, we've got one on the table with autism supporting more. Becky sent out an email this week taking and begging. And I, she said, I'm not short of begging for help. She had a surgery recently. She can't do the work that she's done before. They have gardens that need water, and they have gardens that need weeded, and then that, that, that produce gets turned into half of it, but generally goes to families that can't afford food, and the other half gets sold so that they can do more for families in need with those who have kids that have autism. And I purposely not asked Becky if she got any response in that email because I didn't want to know the answer before we talked this morning. I don't know if people jumped in or not, but I hope we are. I hope we're noticing needs and stepping in to it. Do we demonstrate our love in word and deed? Those are just some church examples. What about in your own life, your own neighborhood, your own mission fields that you are in? There's two more questions, and kind of like the last couple of weeks, they kind of partner up within this last little section in verse 21, where it says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and, we, and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Question three is this, is your conscience guilt-free? Is your conscience guilt-free? Again, I am a big believer that we are not supposed to live in guilt. I believe that guilt should only be for a moment, which leads us to confession, which leads us to repentance, leads us to change in his forgiveness to get us back where there is no longer guilt anyways because it's been washed clean. Is your heart guilt-free or does it condemn you? If, according to this, and this all makes sense, that things are going pretty good, I have more confidence before my Lord than I do when I screwed up. Have you ever had that? Like when things are going good and you're going to Jesus and you're having a talk, it's a pretty, pretty good talk, a worshipful talk and powwowing and everything else. But when I screw up and sin, that same sin that I've been fighting with for years and I've been doing better, but here it is, I just leaned right into it and I did it again and all of a sudden I start realizing, oh my goodness, what did I do? You gave me a path out and I ignored it and I was rebellious. All of a sudden it's real hard to just come to God and just say, well, so things are going good. All of a sudden I've got something on my heart. I've got to talk to you. Daddy, I did it again. Daddy, the, the sin was creeping out the door, and I, I didn't control it, and I let it in again, and I didn't act faithfully. I just keep, I, I, I don't know how to, how to move forward. I know you give me that path. Is your conscience guilt free? And if it's not, again, let it be an invitation, an invitation to his grace and his mercy, so you can have that confidence before God. And question number four is this. Is the presence of the Holy Spirit evident in your life? And underline evident. It's the same as when we're talking about whether or not you have genuine love. Now is it evident in your life? Because if the Holy Spirit is evident in your life, you will be loving. It's just that simple. When we step with the Spirit, it will be there. If not, then we feel guilt and our conscience is not guilt-free.